Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Welcome. My apologies for the late start. The session before ran quite long. Uh, I'd like uh, very much to introduce uh, Juliana Freire uh, from the University of Utah, who will be speaking about simplifying the design of workflows and so on. Okay. Juliana. It's, it's a, the talk is about simplifying, but the title is not very simple. Um, so this is actually joint work with Claudio Silva, who could not be here, and uh, uh, several members of the Vistrails group. So what we've seen in the recent years is that workflows are becoming quite widely used and they've, they've emerged as a new paradigm for representing and managing complex computations, such as, for example, simulations, data analysis, data mining, and visualization. And one important benefit that you have from workflows is that they have the ability to systematically and transparently capture detailed information, provenance information, about this computational process and uh, not only automate the processes but also enable re reproducibility and result sharing. And what we've seen is that workflows are rapidly replacing uh, ad hoc approaches to build uh, uh, computations such as, for example, uh, when you do it through shell scripts, Python, Pro, and so on. And there are a number of systems both in the commercial world like you know, the Mac OS Automator, Windows Workflow Foundation, and Yahoo Pipes, as well as in the academic world like Taverna, Vistrails, and so on. Uh, the issue is that when you're moving from uh, business workflows, this is where workflows came from, to scientific workflows, you have to consider important differences between these two uh, worlds. And here's a summary uh, of these differences. But if you look at business workflows, the purpose is actually different. In business workflows, you're really trying to encode rules uh, and make sure that prescribed processes are executed as required or as planned by a um, organization. And because you need to, to uh, express complex processes, you need to have complex languages such as people that will allow you to uh, encode these control flows. And as a result, you have a complex programming model that you know, considers states and side effects which are needed in, uh, to, uh, in, in the business side of things. If you look at scientific workflows in contrast, uh, they're actually used to build data processing and analysis pipelines. And they often express sequence of data transformations that people have to perform to analyze and understand a particular you know, data set. And they're often expressed in this uh, simpler uh, model, data flow model, that is both stateless and that can actually be thought as a, as a functional program, where a workflow is essentially a sequence of um, functional, uh, function com composed functions. Um, and unlike business workflows, these are very much data intensive and compute intensive tasks. Uh, another important distinction between the two is that whereas in the business world uh, you have workflows that are targeted and workflow systems that are targeted to be used by specialist programmers, in the scientific world what we have is a broad set of users that have a broad range of backgrounds. And you cannot assume that these users necessarily have a programming background. Uh, another fundamental difference between these two worlds is that whereas workflows have been traditionally used to automate repetitive tasks, uh, if you move to scientific uh, world, what you have are exploratory tasks, where change is the norm. And the change is the norm is something that Carol came up with, and I stole it from her. Uh, and in, in, when you're doing that analysis, it's very common that you go through this iterative process where uh, you start with a piece of data, you build a workflow, some data, look at the data product as a result of the workflow, you analyze it, and mm, it's not quite what I want, then you keep uh, changing your workflow, doing new data products, and you do this in an iterative manner as you, as you um, formulate and test your hypothesis. Uh, and here's one example of um, an exploration that you know, was performed in a case study we did in radiation oncology treatment planning. You start with uh, raw data from a CT scan, uh, and you build a workflow to try and generate visualizations of somebody's lung so that you can identify the lesion tissue so that you know where to put the radiation. 
Um, and you go build your workflow and you build an initial visualization, which is not so good. Um, it does solve uh, scaling issues that are uh, uh, due to the scanner, but you, know, it, you don't really see the lung. Right? So you actually get this visualization, you save the workflow spec, you save the, the image, and you put some notes saying that you actually fixed the z-scaling. But then you have to modify your workflow so that you, know, you can try to actually see the lung. And you keep doing this iteratively until you get to uh, the image that actually shows the lesions in the lung. But at the end, you actually have lots of information. Lots of different workflow specifications, lots of nodes, lots of data products, and they're all in a directory structure that is very hard uh, to navigate uh, through. So one problem that uh, you, know, you have to deal with when you're doing these exploratory tasks um, is that you need reflective reasoning. And to quote Don Norman, you know, when you are doing tests that require reflective reasoning, you need to be able to store temporary results. You need to uh, be able to make inferences from the store knowledge, and you need to follow chains of reasoning backward and for forward. Um, and you know, this is a very you know, time-consuming, laborious process. And when we're dealing with the volumes of data that we have today and complex analysis processes that we carry out, that scientists carry out, you really cannot do that with the proper tools. So you need both external aids and tools that facilitate this process. And uh, you know, such tools have been called uh, creativity support tools by Ben Schneiderman. And you also need aid from people. Essentially, you need to allow multiple people to collaborate to uh, do this kind of data exploration. Uh, the, but then there's a problem when you're trying to do um, data exploration through workflow. There are a number of issues. Uh, first and foremost, creating workflows is a very hard task. You know, workflows are very hard to create and they're very hard to refine. Why? Simply because when you're dealing with a workflow, you need to combine multiple tools. And to do so, you need to have in-depth knowledge of these different tools so that you can properly uh, weave them together. So there's a steep learning curve in order to build effective workflows that do what you want. Um, but uh, another important uh, limitation of existing workflow systems is that because they were designed to support repetitive, automate repetitive tasks, they do not provide support for reflective reasoning. Right? As I showed in the previous example, uh, really the history of the exploration process has to be manually maintained through file naming conventions in a very laborious and error-prone process. And in the end, when you have all those files and that manually captured provenance, uh, it can be very hard to understand the exploratory process, the different steps. So it's hard to come back, backtrack, and try different uh, chains of reasoning. Uh, last but not least, you know, there's no real support for allowing groups of people to collaboratively design and refine these workflows. Right? So as a result, what we see today is that uh, the you know, design and refinement of workflow is a major bottleneck in the scientific process. And these were the limitations that actually motivated us to start the Vistrails project. And as uh, you know, our main goal is really to try and provide this creativity support tools and uh, support for collaboration so that you can reduce time to insight, so that the scientists can actually spend time doing their science and you know, uh, not being bothered with all these extra record keeping, bookkeeping uh, that is necessary to save the necessary provenance. Right? So we've been building infrastructure that uh, streamlined these um, exploratory tasks uh, that provides support for uh, collaboration. And there's a big focus in our project on usability, on providing tools and usable interfaces that are really targeted to the broad range of users uh, in e-science projects. Um, and as part of this project, we actually built this uh, system called Vstrails uh, that is an open source, provenance-enabled scientific workflow system that has been applied in many different applications and domains, including environmental modeling, uh, physical, physics simulation, medical studies, and a number of other applications. And since we had our first uh, beta release, we've had uh, in 2007, we had uh, around 6,000 downloads. And uh, today in this talk, uh, what uh, I like to talk about is um, the work that we have done, which shows that we can actually use provenance to support reflective reasoning when you're performing these exploratory tasks to the workflows. And not only that, we can actually leverage this provenance information and we use it to simplify the process of creating and refining workflows. Okay. 
So let's start. So the basic idea that was introduced by these trails that is very simple, but it turned out to be very power powerful, is that these trails, besides capturing data provenance, that is, I give you an image and I can tell you how that image was generated. So besides saving the data provenance, these trails actually consider streets workflows themselves as data product, as a data product. And uh, it keeps detailed information about the whole exploratory process. So here's one example uh, of um, a trail that was created in that radiation oncology treatment planning where each node here actually corresponds to a workflow. Uh, and the edges between these workflows, uh, these nodes, represent you know, changes that are applied to one workflow to generate the other one. So when you have this trail here, you have detailed information of which workflows were derived from which workflow. So you know exactly all the steps that you performed. Um, and you have that in an organized way that really followed the chains of reasoning that you pursued in order to uh, solve a particular problem. And the simple uh, you know, tree structure supports reflective reasoning because it allows users to go back to previous states in time, to previous workflows that they tried and you know, follow uh, um, you know, these chains of reasoning backwards and forwards, and the tree will help guide them through this process. Uh, not only that, now you have all the information uh, all organized, and it's much easier to navigate through and um, reason about the different steps that were followed. All right. Okay, so underlying this, uh, and, and just you know, to give you um, an, an analogy, you can think of, um, uh, these trails, or, or a, a trail like this, as being like an SVN on steroids. Essentially, you can think of this as an advanced uh, version control system for workflows. And it's advanced in a number of ways that I'm gonna uh, hopefully make uh, clear during the talk. All right. So underlying this uh, idea of um, capturing exploratory trails is a new provenance model that we designed called change-based provenance model. And what it does is that, as I said, besides capturing data provenance, it also captures provenance of the workflow evolution, how workflows change over time. And um, a distinguishing um, um, feature of this model is that it actually stores user actions. So as users modify a workflow, adding a module, adding a connection, changing a parameter value, this is what this provenance model actually uh, stores. And what is nice about this is it actually provides a very general model that can actually be used for other applications, for applications other than workflow systems. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, that later. All right. um, and, uh, and here's a uh, you know, more formal way of looking at this trail as, a, as an exploratory trail uh, where you have nodes in the tree which corresponds to workflows and edges between the nodes represent series of actions that transform, say, this workflow into this workflow. And uh, uh, the specification of a given workflow can actually be reconstructed by composing the different actions uh, starting from the empty workflow in the root down to that particular leaf that corresponds to that workflow. So it's very simple. Uh, but it's simple, but as I said, it's quite powerful and it provides you know, the, uh, uh, the infrastructure to, uh, that allows a number of operations that can be very useful when you're doing data exploration. One example of such uh, operation is uh, the ability to explore large parameter spaces. So using this model in order to explore parameter space, say for example you, you're um, doing a visualization of an isosurface and you want to find you know, different visualizations for diff several different isosurface values. You can actually use the change-based provenance model to encode that. And the way that you do it is that you get the workflow that you use to uh, create that visualization and you compose with it sequences of parameter changes. And by doing so, you can actually, uh, in a single step with a single operation, create a series of visualizations that use those different parameters. And what is more uh, interesting um, is that the same uh, mechanism can actually be used to not only try just different parameter values, but actually modifications to the workflows. So uh, because you know, this change-based um, uh, actions can represent, say, for example, the addition of modules, deletion of modules, addition of connections, you can use the same mechanism to try different workflow structures, different workflow systems, uh, sorry, instances, 
for uh, in a given exploration. So for example, you have a bunch of isosurface um, uh, visualizations and you'd like to see the same kinds of data sets but using a different uh, uh, visualization technique like for example volume rendering. You could use this to actually modify this series of uh, visualizations uh, in a very scalable way. Uh, the other operation that is enabled by this change-based provenance is very useful for reflective reason is the ability to compute workflow differences. So if you think about workflows, workflows are graphs. And if you're trying to compare two workflows, you need to do subgraph isomorphism, which is a task that is uh, known for being computationally hard. But in this trails, because each workflow is actually represented by a sequence of actions, Computing the difference of two workflows can actually be done very simply in linear time by simply subtracting one series of actions uh, from the other one, right? And we actually leveraged this, and in Vistrails we built this uh, visual differencing uh, interface that allows you to visually compare these different workflows. So uh, you can see if you're comparing here two different versions, this and this one, um, you can actually uh, see visually that you know there are nodes that are unique to the orange version, nodes that are unique to the blue version uh, in the tree, and you have the other nodes that are shared. Right? And it is especially useful when you're, you're in uh, collaborative environments where you know, I, I develop a workflow, I sent to my colleague, he made some changes, and I'd like to know what exactly they did. And this provides a very you know, natural and easy way to uh, um, uh, identify these changes, to understand these changes. Um, the, the third benefit is that you know, this model also makes it very easy to support um, collaborative design of workflows. Right? Uh, so you can actually store all this change-based provenance inside a database, and you can uh, provide uh, different ways of accessing this information, either synchronously by having you know, this data as the changes that you're making to your workflow being automatically and, uh, and updated in real time in the database, and you can also provide uh, asynchronous access, similar to an SVN where you know, a user can check out a V-Trail or a trail make some changes, check that in, and synchronize the versions with the uh, centralized server. And the reason that um, uh, provenance helps here is that if you look at the change-based provenance, it's monotonic. Any change that you make to your workflow is captured. So everything is, you know, just keeps growing and growing. As a result, synchronization is really easy. Uh, in fact, we can actually support uh, synchronization in a distributed uh, manner uh, without really the need for a centralized repository. Uh, and by the way, if you have any questions or uh, comments, you know, please feel free to interrupt me. Uh, so just to summarize uh, this idea of change-based provenance, um, uh, it has a number of benefits. First and foremost, it's, it's very general. Uh, and because you can have different algebras or different language to represent the actions, it can work with many different systems other than uh, uh, workflow systems. Essentially, any system that has an undo redo stack, right? Because what we can do is we can actually um, uh, design the actions to actually mirror the semantics of the application. And uh, we've done this for uh, two different interactive applications that cannot be integrated workflows. Uh, one of them was uh, Paraview, which is a three, uh, with a, it's a, um, large-scale visualization tool, uh, widely used by DOE uh, applications and labs. And the other tool that we've done this for was uh, Autodesk Smile, which is um, a 3D um, uh, design tool. And for both tools, uh, we actually, uh, all that, what we did was uh, to design an algebra. So for example, for Maya, uh, the kinds of actions, instead of add module, delete module, what we have for Maya is add scene, add an object, add a light source. Right? And we can capture all these actions the same way that we capture the trail for uh, uh, workflow-based explorations. Right? And by you know, doing so, we can actually leverage all those operations that I, I mentioned about, uh, both in terms of collaboration, finding difference, doing parameter exploration, uh, and combining that provenance infrastructure in a more loosely coupled way with existing interactive applications. Uh, the other advantage of the change-based model is that it provides a very concise representation, right? So now we are only saving actions, and it's a lot more efficient to do so than saving multiple workflow versions, right? So it's much more space efficient. Uh, the other advantage is that uh, you, with a single model, with that model, we can capture both data and workflow provenance, 
and we have the benefits of existing workflow system in terms of uh, being able to reproduce results, but we also keep this additional information, detailed information about the exploration, uh, exploration process, which can be very useful uh, mm -hmm. in practice. So uh, in the, through this work, uh, what we've shown is that you can actually leverage provenance uh, for a lot more than reproducibility, right? You can you know, use it to support reflective reasoning um, and a number of operations that can actually simplify and streamline you know, common exploratory pro uh, uh, processes when you're doing data analysis and visualization. Um, so the, the other problem that I mentioned in, in the introduction is that, uh, yes, you need support for, for reflective reasoning, but you still have a problem of creating these workflows. Creating workflows is very hard, time-consuming task, right? Uh, and uh, what uh, we'd like to do is to be able to leverage this province not only to, to support reflective reasoning, but also to help simplify the creation of, and refinement of workflows. And uh, one common task when you're programming or doing workflows or building workflows is you often, it's ideal you'd like to start through existing examples, right? So if you have a new data set and you need to visualize it, say it's an unstructured grid, so it would be nice to find if you have a workflow collection, oh, find me all the workflows that actually visualize an unstructured grid because that will help me find examples that, will, you know, that I can use to start with. Or, um, for example, if I want to um, you know, uh, build a histogram, find me all workflows that output histograms. Or if I'm a more uh, uh, expert, kind of an expert user, uh, and I want to say extract an ISO surface, but I want to do a simplification before, I can do a structured query that you know, asks to let me find all the workflows that contain a given module uh, uh, preceded by some other module. In this case, an ISO surface extraction preceded by a simplification module. Right. The, the problem that we face when you're trying to do this kind of search and queries over workflows and workflow collections are, is that you know, workflows are graphs. And it can be very hard to specify queries over workflow over graphs using text-based languages. Why? Because essentially you need to serialize your query into this text, and serializing a graph in text can be hard for anybody, even for expert programmers. Right. So instead of doing that, um, and again, following our goal of building usable tools, what we developed in Bridge Trails was a query by example interface uh, where you, the, the student, uh, Carlos Scheidegger, who developed this, uh, calls it uh, We See Week, which is what you see is what you query. And the idea of this interface is that you can actually build these structural workflow queries uh, using the same interface that you use to build the actual workflows. So you have a query pane where you say, oh, find me all workflows that have this structure and that have this kind of pattern for a given input attribute. And the results are actually visually displayed and you can scroll uh, and browse through all the different uh, uh, matches. And through that, you can actually select the workflow that met best matches um, uh, you know, the test that you may be, uh, that you have to do. Right. Uh, so this helps you find workflow samples, but sometimes what you really want to do is to refine a workflow, to uh, you know, change a workflow in a specific way, right? And as I said, this can be hard because not only it requires domain knowledge, but it requires deep familiarity with a variety of tools. So just to give you an example, this um, workflow here in the middle was workflow that was used to generate these data products, which essentially help, help the scientist, um, a visualization uh, expert, um, uh, analyze and compare different isosurface extraction techniques. This workflow here actually combines uh, five different tools. It has modules that come from five different tools. So it can be very hard to assemble these workflows. Uh, <clears throat> so um, one uh, way that we found in order to uh, um, mitigate this problem is um, try to apply concepts from you know, Web 2.0 uh, technology. Um, although you know refinements are complex, there are some refinements that uh, are pretty common that you know people do uh, and that you could actually leverage and reuse. Right? So, for example, changing if I have a visualization, changing the rendering technique. If I have a visualization, publishing that on the web. So, this kind of refinements is, is it's, uh, often the case that other people have done them before. Right? So, the idea of this operation that we introduce in these trails, this analogy operation, is to leverage the wisdom of the crowd or the collective wisdom um, 
in order to automate the process of refining workflows. And the idea is pretty simple. Uh, suppose that you know, I have a visualiz the visualization expert had a workflow to generate this particular data product here. Uh, and he changed the workflow by adding this blue module in order to smooth that uh, uh, data set, that particular uh, object. Right? Then I come and I'm a database person. I have no clue about visualization. But I do have a simple workflow that generates uh, these uh, images here. But these images look very choppy and ragged and they, you know, they don't look very good and I'd like to smooth them. But I don't know how to do that. But I can do that by analogy. Right? I can actually say, due to this image here, uh, apply to this image here, the same process that was applied to take this from this. Right? And as a result, the system actually automatically applied this change to my workflow and generates a new data product. And they, it can do all of that without me having to directly edit the workflow specification. So it looks like magic, but it's actually a very interesting algorithm that supports this operation. Right? So let me go through a brief example to give you some idea of uh, how this analogy operation works. So suppose I have uh, three workflows. I have first the workflow A that generates a simple visualization of uh, protein. Uh, and I have another workflow that was a refinement of the workflow A uh, that generates um, a, a PDB report that includes the visualization as well as additional information about the protein. But then I have another workflow here, C, that the visualization expert created that has a much fancier uh, visualization of the protein. It's three-dimensional, it has shading, it's much nicer. And what I would like to do is to generate a PDB report similar to this one, but with this nice visualization. Right? So how does the analogy operation work? So the first step is to actually compute the difference between the A and B. That is, what uh, change from A to get to B. Right? Just like a patch that you have in your programs and uh, version control systems. Except that um, this patch may not really be consistent uh, or uh, uh, compatible with workflow C. So if I apply this patch to my workflow C, uh, it may lead to a workflow that really is not valid, it cannot be executed. So in order to get around that, what we do uh, before applying the patch is to actually find correspondences between workflow A and workflow C. And we do that using an algorithm that's similar to page rank, where we define the notion of similarity recursively. We say that two modules are similar if they're similar and their neighborhood is similar. Right? And the idea is that we actually diffuse the similarity scores for these different modules using uh, you know, uh, eigenvalue decompositions. And what we end up with are you know, a set of mappings and correspondences between modules in one workflow and the modules in the other workflow. And although you cannot read this, you can see that you can actually get a very good approximation. So the uh, module here that's called file that reads a file is actually mapped to the module here in C that's called HTTP file that actually reads a file from a website. Right? So once we have the map and the way of translating between A and C, what we do is we use this mapping to translate my delta AB, the differences in AB. And once we apply this translation, we can actually now do the patch over uh, uh, workflow C to get workflow D. All right. So um, you know it's uh, it's um, uh, it, it's interesting and it's actually very useful uh, in practice because, as I said, it allows workflows to be refined without requiring a user to uh, directly modify the workflow specification. And you know when I show this to scientists, they kind of like, oh, I, I love this. Because, you know, it's a, again, modifying these workflows is uh, very complex. And there's something beeping here. Uh, uh, the other thing that analogies can be useful for is to actually uh, do scalable updates. Right? So you have you know, a series of visualizations, and you say, apply this change to this 100 different visualizations that I've generated before. So it can actually really speed up you know, this exploratory process. Uh, the downside is that this is not foolproof. And you know, it's not guaranteed to work every time. You know, there are some patches that really are going to be incompatible, and there's no algorithm that is going to fix that. Right? Um, but if it doesn't work, at least it gives you an approximation that you can later add it and try to fix it. Um, and again, re remember that we use this monotonic provenance model where the analogy is actually going to create a new version. Uh, so you can actually choose to uh, disregard that if 
that doesn't really work. And a lot of the, some of the work that we've been doing uh, recently uh, to improve those analogies is uh, trying to include domain knowledge in order to uh, um, uh, generate better analogies, as well as learn from user feedback. If something fails, we can keep track of what the user does to fix that. And uh, you know, hopefully in a later time, we can actually generate better analogies. Uh, Again, analogies are good and it can help refinement, but they can only help in refinement where you know what you're trying to do, right? Many times when you're building workflows, you really don't know what you have to do next. And you need some guidance in this process, you know, just to create, say, a visualization uh, uh, pipeline, visualization workflow, uh, you can use, you know, many libraries. For example, one widely used library is the one called VTK, the Visualization Toolkit. <laughs> Uh, but VTK has hundreds of different modules, right? So you do a VTK reader, what should you do next? What is there that you can use? Um, and, you know, just like for analogies, um, you know, borrowing from this idea of collaboration and leveraging the wisdom of the crowd, crowd if you actually have available uh, collections of workflows and provenance, you can actually mine this collection and try to find patterns or common modules that co-occur so that when somebody tries to build a workflow, you can actually suggest possible completions for that workflow. So the way that uh, uh, we built a system called Viscomplete, and essentially it's like a workflow recommendation system, and it's similar to like a web browser completing the URLs, except that this is actually completing uh, workflow specifications. And the way that it works is that it actually processes, if you have a collection of pipelines of workflows, it will mine, it will discover these workflow patterns and create a path database. And as people um, are, start to build the workflow, it will go through this path database and uh, try to recommend uh, paths or new graphs that uh, have been used in the past. And as a result, you know, you can actually get lots of good suggestions. So this is an example where somebody added a module that reads a data set and the system um, suggested two, three different completions that would generate three very different visualizations of that particular data set. Uh, to give you a better idea, let me show you a short demo of um, uh, the system in action. <clears throat> so we consider two different scenarios, one for a novice user that doesn't know much about visualization, uh, and he adds a data reader to read the file, and then the system will uh, suggest a number of different um, workflows that they can use and they can scroll through those and you know the system actually uh, suggests complete workflows and you can choose to accept all modules or just a subset of those modules and you can you know select what uh, uh, the, the workflow that you uh, uh, better fits your needs. In terms of the expert user, uh, not only can the system, uh, in this case the user added a module that does as a surface extraction and you can see that the system will suggest completions both before and after that module. And as a user adds new modules to refine this workflow, uh, not only to suggest new modules, but also it will automatically connect, properly connect the systems to other modules that are already in the workflow. So you add VTK property and you see that it's snapped already uh, as a, um, um, sorry, a connection into this VTK actor. Right. Uh, so let me, so this video is somewhat long, so I can skip that. And you can actually see that I put a link in my slides. Then you can go through it later if you'd like. Uh, so we actually did a performance evaluation of the system. And for a set of representative tasks, six different tasks uh, performed by over 30 users, uh, we've uh, found that by using this complete, you can actually reduce the number of actions in over 50%. Um, not only that, the completions that are suggested by our system, um, the, the, the successful ones, the one that the user selects, are also always um, amongst the first uh, four suggestions. Right? Uh, and unfortunately, I won't have time to go over the details, um, but uh, you, know, you, you can actually check our paper for details on not only how we build the path database and mine the patterns, uh, but also on how we uh, uh, implement the completion algorithm. Okay. So um, one other thing that I wanted to talk about, and uh, I was told that's going to have you know, uh, a little more time, is um, uh, the kinds of um, new and transformative directions that having these um, workflow and provenance uh, enabled systems can actually uh, um, uh, 
bring to fruition, right? So uh, one of the things that we've been looking at is to use this more scientific workflow plus provenance infrastructure to improve the way that we actually publish such scientific results. We've been doing a lot of good research. People have been using um, uh, scientific workflows, and it's all great, but when we look at the papers we're publishing, they all look like the same as when, you know, many, many, many years ago, right? And uh, we get a paper, and it's, we have many examples of uh, infamous cases of uh, uh, um, academic integrity or lack of thereof where people fake results. Uh, there are also uh, famous examples of people uh, that made mistakes and, you know, honest mistakes in their publications. And all of that because the results that we publish cannot be reproduced and not, not very well documented. So you have your results, you publish simply a graph that says, oh, this is what I found. Right? We don't really know how you got there. So the idea that we're pushing is that uh, we should actually publish papers that have deep captions. That not, when you publish your image and your graphs, you also include with that detailed provenance information on how you got to those results. Not only the workflow for the data, but also for all the exploration process that led you to those conclusions. Right? And one uh, uh, bright side of this is that we've seen recently many uh, organizations, uh, journals, and you know, uh, uh, conferences that are actually encouraging people to publish these uh, reproducible results, right? And besides, you know, the ability to do, you know, validate uh, uh, work, um, uh, by having these provenance-enabled papers, you can actually um, describe more of your discovery process. You know, right now we only publish successes, but if you're able to uh, publish the whole provenance of the exploratory process, uh, you can also publish mistakes and people can learn from your mistakes. Um, and this can also, uh, you know, speed up science because now you have reproducible res results and you ha have ideas you can more easily build upon other people's work, right? Uh, the, the requirement, though, that we need in order to uh, have, you know, better publications, publications of the future is that we actually need tools that support uh, uh, um, this kind of uh, paper. And uh, using this, this trail infrastructure, we have actually came up with a, a built a prototype that you know goes one step towards uh, you know a reproducible or provenance enabled paper. Right? So here is a short video that uh, illustrates how you know this infrastructure works. Uh, this is um, uh, we're showing here just a you know plain uh, PDF paper that has um, uh, <clears throat> sorry some uh, PNG images in them. Right? And what we'd like to do is to actually replace those with actually uh, images that have their provenance associated with them. So to do so, we uh, you know, use these trails um, and uh, we obtain the workflow that actually was used to produce those uh, two images, the histogram as well as the the ISO surface, right? So this trail connects to the database and tries to retrieve um, the trail, the exploration trail, uh, where the scientist actually generated those two images, right? Um, and that exploration trail is the one that is highlighted here in blue called range set. And in this trail, you can actually select a node, run it so that you can see its results in the visualization spreadsheet. And if it runs, you can see those two different images. Uh, then um, we not only want to provenance enable the paper, but we also want to slightly change the image, zoom it in. Um, we can save the new image. Um, then we can save our changes to, uh, we can name the, the, the new visualization, right, because it's a new version, it's a change. It's a, pa a figure for my size paper. Um, now you save the, all the information to the database, and what we have now is actually a tag that has the, uh, that you can actually, LaTeX tag, that you can actually include in your LaTeX document. So the idea is that you can delete your old uh, PNG figure, it's commented out here, and you can add uh, that link, where, which when you actually compile your LaTeX document, what it's gonna do is that it's, contact, it's gonna contact the Vistrail server, execute the workflow, save the file, right? And now your PDF document has an um, uh, uh, image that is actually active. So if you click on that, again, this trail is gonna be invoked and you can actually get access to the workflow that generated that image, 
right? And uh, the same mechanism we actually implemented both for uh, Microsoft tools such as Word and PowerPoint as well as for wikis. So I'm not going to show the rest of this because it's going to take a while. <clears throat> okay. Let me go back here. So this is just one example of, um, of an application that actually you know, can leverage this um, you know, provenance and workflow uh, infrastructure. Uh, and there are a number of others that I won't have time to uh, talk about, but they're very promising. Like, for example, using this kind of infrastructure to improve teaching and learning. Uh, so just to summarize, because the, I have somebody we're running late. Uh, so I hope that I, I, I you know, convinced you that um, providing support for exploratory tests is essential for, uh, for, to foster wider adoption and more effective use of scientific workflow systems. And also that um, you know, provenance is extremely important. And not only it can be used to support reflective reasoning, but it also enables a number of tools and uh, intuitive interfaces that simplify the tedious process of uh, constructing and uh, refining workflows. And combining these kind of features, provenance, uh, reflective reasoning, and these intuitive interfaces with you know, these large repositories of uh, workflow and provenance can be extremely powerful. So we've seen recently a number of workflow uh, uh, repositories such as you know, uh, My Experiments, Yahoo Pipes, and a number of them where people are actually sharing uh, their workflows and computational tasks. Right? Uh, so by combining these infrastructures, uh, we can actually expose scientists to uh, examples of techniques and tools that they would not otherwise be exposed to. And this has a lot of potential in terms of you know, allowing them to learn by example, expediting their scientific training, and potentially reducing the time to insight. So and I really believe that you know, this combination has a lot of promise and that you know, combining provenance workflows and wide scale, large scale sharing have the potential to revolutionize science. And with that, I will close. I have to thank the people that have funded this project as well as uh, all the people in the Vistrails group that have contributed to uh, the, many of the ideas that I talked about here today. Uh, so thank you so much. Are there any questions? Everything was self-explanatory. You, yeah, so you, you, you came to see a reprise of the talk. Because <laughs> I gave a tutorial that, where I covered actually the, you know, a lot of details of Vistrails and how to use Vistrails this morning. And I see some people that are actually in the tutorial here. Uh, okay, thank you so much. Ordinarily I, would, uh, ordinarily, I would encourage more questions, but I think the presentation was so complete. That, thank you. Uh, <laughs> it's not an issue.